Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Empower session. Um, Empower is one of the Escalator tracks. So Escalator is a, product, uh, is a project um, funded by Sadilar. And um, yes, Empower is one of the six tracks that are available as part of the Escalator program. And what we are doing in the Empower sessions is we are looking at the research life cycle. Um, we've had previous sessions before that covered let me see if I remember, that covered the um, preparation and discovery. And then we looked at analysis. And in this session, we are going to be looking at writing. Our kickoff uh, session looked at the entire research life cycle. And that was in May, if I remember well. And yeah, so in this session, we'll be covering um, focusing on the writing phase of the research life cycle. And today we have Neo Putini, who will be doing the presentation. Um, thank you so much, Neo, for agreeing to do this. And yeah, you may introduce yourself and start. Um, thank you for having me. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Neo Putini. Um, I'm currently um, a project coordinator at um, Language Inc. I'm also um, a Master of Arts student uh, focusing on corpus linguistics with an interest in digital humanities and natural language processing and um, developing under-resourced African languages. Um, so before um, I start, um, I just want to speak on the code of um, conduct that um, we have. So um, Escalator is dedicated to creating a safe space. So um, we'll please need for um, people to be respectful towards one another, um, accept constructive criticism, um, but most um, importantly, as, be uh, um, inclusive. mentioned that um, Empower and um, the Escalator um, it's a program to assist women in humanities and social science to expand their digital and computational skills and provide a learning um, community within um, humanities and social science um, in South Africa. So what we normally do is that we have two sessions um, a month. We have the presentation, which um, focuses on software and practices, and then we have um, the co-working sessions. So after this session, um, the next session will have um, the co-working um, session. Okay, so today we'll be focusing on writing. So prior to um, today, we've had um, other presentations which focused on preparation, discovery and analysis. And then today we'll obviously be focusing on um, writing. So um, within the, the, excuse me, the, the, the writing process, um, you, um, you visualize what you um, want to um, obviously write down. Um, you, you, once you've gathered, because since you've gathered all um, <clears throat> of your, your information, you structure your paper and then you start your writing process, you evaluate, revise and everything, and then, Afterwards, um, you'll have um, the three other um, stages left, which is the publication, outreach, and assessment. Okay, so within the writing process, um, you plan and you outline, you have your draft, you redraft and revise, you edit and proofread, and then um, throughout your writing process, um, you look at your formatting, in-text referencing, and you build your bibliography. So in the planning and outlining process, and um, this is when you create an outline of how you will structure your paper prior to um, you start to, um, your writing. Here you will focus on your main ideas and how you will organize them, keeping in mind that you're constantly changing and adding and so on and so forth. So it's not just um, a, a linear process with regards to how you plan. And then with the drafting stage, and um, this is where you actually begin writing your paper. Here you will use, um, You'll make use of your plan and outline and build on the ideas that you had um, jotted down. It's suggested um, that one starts writing the main body of the text, saving the introduction for later, once you have a clear idea of what you will be introducing. And then in your 
redrafting and revising um, stage. Um, as a student, I would say, um, to me, this would mean that I've sent through um, my draft chapter and now it's coming back with corrections, track changes and comments, and um, I'll need to implement them and um, then send it back. As a researcher um, or a writer, I would say this phase would require one to take a break um, from their work, leave it um, for a few days, and then come back to it with um, a fresher eye so you can be able to look at it objectively um, where you make changes to your overall argument, you reorder your text and then cutting out or reordering unclear text as well as adding new text if you have any new information um, to add. And then in the editing um, and proofreading phase. Um, so with editing, um, it focuses on clarity and sentence structure. Proofreading involves reading your text and um, removing any types, um, any typo, sorry, and ensuring stylistic consistency. Um, here you would look out for um, grammatical errors, redundancy and rep repetition, spelling grammars, um, spelling errors, sorry, etc. Okay, so the two um, tools, um, writing tools um, that um, I've been exposed to and um, people that I know use, uh, Microsoft Word and Google Docs. So Microsoft Word, um, I'd say is more um, offline than um, Google Docs is um, the one that more people normally use. Um, but I've noticed that um, with um, Google Docs, especially when I'm doing um, research, um, participating in research with um, professors from whether it's um, America or South Africa, is that they'll prefer Google Docs because you are able to edit it in real time. So whatever response um, a person gets, they're able to um, sort of jot that down um, immediately and it saves onto um, their whole document. Um, with uh, Microsoft Word, um, it, it, when Norma, uh, Norma mentioned that um, it's more offline than it is with Google Docs and it's better to use Google Docs, especially when you're collaborating with people so um, numerous people can um, edit the document um, simultaneously or at different times. Um, with Microsoft Word, it would take a bit um, longer because you'd obviously have to send some of the document or upload it onto SharePoint and then um, they'd edit and then you'd wait for um, the editing or them adding and then you'd get back to it. But with regards to the writing process, um, as a student, um, I will send in my chapter and then I will get it. And then it will have um, track changes, it will have comments, and then you accept or you reject. And then you can also convert from Microsoft Word to Google Docs by just uploading your um, document onto um, your Google Drive. And then you um, give permission to um, and you share it to the people that you want to um, share it with. You have the option to um, lock it where it's view only. And you also can um, grant access for people to um, edit um, and add in everything. Um, I think another thing that um, that I wanted to touch on, especially with the with these writing tools, is the fact that they're mobile friendly. Like they're mobile phone friendly. You can use them on your phone. Um, I remember when I was doing my honors, um, I actually had an issue with my laptop. So most of my research, um, I did it on my phone using Google Chrome, and I was typing on Microsoft Word. So from back then, I've just always been offline. So I think I'll always resort to Microsoft Word, um, Word first and then probably go to Google Docs. Um, so I think that's the one thing I like about it is that so whenever wherever you are, you don't have to have your laptop open in order to um, be collaborating or editing a document with your colleagues and everything. You can always just use your phone and um, get it done. Okay, so with... Um, Citation tools, um, a citation management tool um, allows you to build a collection of your references where you can include citation information, URL links, notes, and um, PDF files. Um, within these libraries, you can group, organize, and search for items, share items with others, and back up your library um, online. So with um, a citation generator, this is often available um, online um, as uh, websites 
which um, allow you to input dissertation information, and then you can create um, a, a bibliography that you can copy and paste um, into um, your, your documents. I think for people who have worked with reference managers, there's um, some, like, I think Anne could probably speak about this quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of, of challenges using reference managers. I wonder if there's anybody here who has a good story about using reference managers. And do you think using Zotero with Google Docs was better than doing it manually? Um, I understand the 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 writing in. I mean, a while, I mean, I used to do that as well, kind of before citation managers became a thing, really. Um, and you do feel a bit more in control doing it that way. Um, but the thing is, with a citation manager, it just and, and it's it's getting over that hurdle of learning a new tool, which it would, you know that can also be a bit daunting and kind of scary to take on learning a new tool. But once you put the effort in and learn the tool, it's just so worth it. It'll make your life so much easier. I mean, for example, you you know they, you have journals that you know the format of the citations are numbered, for example. So if rather than alphabetical order. It's it, you know the, the references in the paper itself are numbered, and then you know the reference list is all is all numbered. And the pain with that is that if anything in your paper changes, if you're doing it manually, you'd have to go through your entire paper and edit, you know, each number, and to keep so to, the the room for error there is really huge to keep track of of the references that you've got and the numbers that that are attached to them, that sort of thing. Whereas if you have a a tool for a citation manager, it just, if anything changes, it happens automatically throughout the whole paper. So it might be a pain to, not a pain, but it might be daunting to, to learn it um, or to, to actually learn it is okay, but to, to make that step to decide that you're gonna learn it um, is what you have to do. And then it, it just makes your life so much easier. Um, so like integrating Zotero, for example, with Google Docs, that, that integration, it can be slow sometimes, but still, that integration does work. Um, I mean, so I can just highly recommend it that you, yeah, that you use a citation manager because it, it really will make your life so much easier. It'll save you so much time. And yeah, you know, as I say, that room for error, with you know, for you to to keep track of your references as opposed to it happening automatically is yeah, much better. <laughs> so I can highly recommend it. So Terra is a good one. Um, yeah. I don't know what else I can say with that. I can't Thanks. convince you that it's a good idea to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially like those numbered reference lists. I mean, it's so easy to make a mistake. And it's just the, the, the time that it takes, if anything in your references changes, to then go back and manually do it versus if it's automated and it just happens automatic. And, and I mean, it can take a while for it to update. Um, but it'll still be much faster than you doing it manually. So yeah, I can, that's my plug for citation managers. <laughs> so it's well <laughs> worth the effort of, of learning to do it. Um, yeah, I can, it's very much, very worth it. I think especially if you're going to be in academia for another year or two, taking the time to learn the reference manager might save you so much time going forward so, so and it's also I, storage i mean you can you, you can keep lists of all your references obviously so in mendeli and zotero they all have you know whereas you probably if you download the papers that you're referring to for example you maybe keep those on your computer or in a hard drive or whatever whereas your a reference manager you can I mean, you can refer, you can link it to a folder on your computer um, if you have the actual hard copy saved. Sorry, the hard copy, the electronic copy PDF saved, um, or it can just link to where it is online. Um, and you can sort of organize according to your subject areas, and you know you can organize folders and sort of file the papers in different folders. And it just you know you can really keep track rather than sifting through hard drive full of papers for example that you're looking for a particular particular thing it's just it's a comp it's a really good management system for all of your your references for me uh, with papers it is uh, particularly useful because you don't have to 
go in and manually change references every time you must resubmit a paper or if your um, reviewer comes back and has got input around um, articles or texts that you need to incorporate or exclude. And then I was saying also maybe the thesis isn't really the, the, the place if you are scared to experiment with these. You can maybe do a low stakes things like a, like a conference presentation or a journal article um, and try to, to work on that using a reference manager to see if you feel like you can get the hang of it. Um, I can definitely understand the thesis because there's so much at stake, but maybe try it with something low, low stakes and then you'll find that um, if you're comfortable, you'll easily be able to change whatever it is you've done on your thesis. I know with my PhD, now that I'm writing papers from it, it's so helpful that I've got those um, references on a manager because it is literally cutting and pasting and the references pop up. I don't need to do it every single time I write a paper from it. So it will be worth it in the long run, as the person, the previous person said. But if you're scared, start with something um, small that you don't feel like is life and death for you. For people who have used reference managers, what, which one would you suggest to start learning? And I think if I can say that most universities or many, some university libraries offer support and licensing. Uh, I know when I was with Northwest University, they had EndNote support. The libraries were offering training um, and, and all of that. So people can get access to training within their university. And if you don't know who to ask, let us know. And we can probably find the person to put you in touch um, for the South African universities. And then for um, if you don't have any support, Zotero is a free and open source tool and becoming more and more um, widely adopted. Um, so you don't have to pay a license fee and you've got all the functionality. So Zotero is, is definitely a good choice if you don't have support from um, within your institution or if you're not affiliated with an institution. Okay, so these are just um, a few of the citation tools um, that um, I came across though there are um, a whole lot more. Um, so we have um, Microsoft Word uh, referencing tool. Um, I've been using Microsoft for so long and I've never used the referencing tool, which is really strange, which, um, well, it will take baby steps and I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one and then uh, move on. And then also, um, as Analda has mentioned, um, there's Otero, which is also part of Popular One. They recently had um, a workshop um, on campus for it. Um, and then there's EndNote. So EndNote, um, you do pay for EndNote, but then they do give you um, a 30-day free trial. So maybe just to play around and see how it works, maybe um, use it then. But then, um, as you mentioned, maybe it's um, best to see what um, the institution actually offers, because um, most of the time um, at a university, um, they'll offer something and then um, you'll be able to use um, the, the premium um, feature um, absolutely. Yeah. And then um, how to choose a citation tool. So um, the thing that you need to consider um, when you um, are choosing the citation tool that you want to use, for example, um, first, um, hence um, I mentioned that it's always best to check um, if your organization or institution doesn't have um, a license to any of um, the tools that you might um, want to use, um, how you'll be able to access it, um, where your database is stored, um, the ability to work offline, and the ability to work in a group project or to share citations um, with um, others or, or your colleagues, and then if it's word processing, um, word processor um, com compatible. So I think with um, the, the 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 offline um, consideration, I think it's um, quite important, um, especially. Um, here in South Africa, considering we have really bad um, network, once we have like load shedding and all of that, um, I think that would play um, a big part in being able to sort of access um, the, the, the online um, tools and stuff. 
and then um, other software to also use um, uh, plagiarism detection software. So um, these um, use um, advanced data pay software to scan for matches between um, the text that you've written um, alongside um, existing texts, which then results um, in a similarity report. And then the report assists with detecting mainly if um, students um, have copied text and um, they haven't attributed um, the the authors which um, they got it from. And I know with um, submitting um, at um, a university level is that um, you need to have a certain percentage in order to be able to um, submit your paper for marking. And if it's above that level, then um, you have to take it back and um, rephrase everything, um, edit and so on and so forth. So some of um, the tools that I've used, um, I currently use uh, Grammarly, um, at university level, um, we've used um, Turnitin, and um, there's also um, Pro Writing Aid. So I think with the good thing with um, the Grammarly is that um, we do get um, the premium package um, as students, so we're able to um, do um, the, the 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 plagiarism check, and you get your report. And turn it in. We only normally use it um, with your lecturer when your lecturer is actually checking um, the final product of um, your, your your paper. So um, okay, that um, is it with um, my talk um, with regards to um, the writing process. Um, I've noticed that um, a lot of the tools that um, I did mention today, some people are already using them. And I'm hoping that um, myself and Utandega will take the initiative to actually try some of these, play around with them, um, use the free trial and see um, which ones um, we can use. Um, so for the next session, um, it will be on the 25th um, of August. And that will be um, a co-working session, um, a discussion session where we can expand more on what we spoke about today. And we'll also be including um, the, the the analysis talk that we had because um, that one we had it um, later in the month. So we will be um, collaborating with um, the co-working session will consist of analysis and um, writing. So hopefully you'll be able to attend and we'll see you there. So um, the next um, software and practice um, session will be on uh, publication. And I think that will be on the 8th of um, September. So please don't forget to um, register for that as well, because I do know that you have to register um, for the different talks um, separately. This is just the contact information. Um, there's Twitter. Um, there's the website handle as well as an email, the email address, if maybe you want to get in contact um, with an elder normal lungelo and stuff. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to be here to listen to my talk. Uh, my colleague Unoma Lungelo will do um, a presentation on LaTeX and Overleaf. Uh, Noma Lungelo, over to you. Thank you so much, No. That was so insightful. Thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. I am Noma. I work in Talarify. Um, Escalator, as I mentioned, Escalator is one of our, our um, projects that we have in Talarify. I am the project manager and data science mentor in Talarify. Um, the last part of my title I'm still growing into, so I'm still in the learning phase. And um, I have a chemical engineering background. One of the reasons why I'm here or I've, I found myself in Talarify is the skills development and knowledge um, transferring part of what Talarify does, the, the capacity development. I am very passionate about capacity development and just sharing knowledge and empowering people to um, do their work better. And that is what I'm hoping to achieve today to just, you know, um, introduce you or maybe share some things that I know about LaTeX. Okay, so um, basically your writing tools 
must help you to communicate all your hard work. You've worked very hard. You've done all your research. You've done your experiments. Um, you've done your analysis. And now you need to present your work. And you want to do this in a sophisticated manner and using a tool that doesn't give you headaches, right? Um, but what, one of the things, oh, so this is literally from what Neo was saying that um, your writing tools must help make the writing process easy. So it must make the planning easy, the drafting, the actual content and editing and formatting. So today I'll be talking to you about LaTeX, which is one of the writing tools you can use. So LaTeX is a document preparation system. Um, it's not a word processor like Microsoft Word or LibreOffice. Um, it is used as a document markup language. And it's, uh, I, as I've mentioned, that it's not like Microsoft Word. So what you type is not exactly what you see, but I'll explain that later and I'll show it to you as well on a demo. Um, Okay, so features on LaTeX. So why you would want to use LaTeX, right? Um, so it's typesetting for journal articles, for technical reports, for books and slides. So there's a wide range of um, documentation that you can write using your LaTeX. Um, when you use LaTeX, you have control over large documents containing sections, cross-references, tables, and figures. Um, it has advanced type settings for mathematics. So if you work with equations, it's very good for equations. And then automation, very important. Citation, which has been spoken about in Neo's presentation. So it makes um, automation and uh, citation bibliography is very, very easy. Um, okay, I should not say easy easier maybe um it is a multilingual type setting so you you'll be able to do your spell check in different languages and um it makes your pictures your images your artwork look very beautiful as well so just formatting is much much easier with latex and you can format your entire um document to how you want it to look and if you make changes things don't then move around which i'm going to explain in the next slide as well um, so just the other advantages of, of using LaTeX, as I've mentioned, is that your documents are beautiful, your visual components, such as your fonts, your spacing and your line breaks, your images, your equation will come out looking beautiful and very consistent as well. Um, if you work with equations and just in writing in general, you know, sometimes you have to space three times and you must go check how many, how many times you spaced in the other line, you know, so with LaTeX, everything is automated you just type your content and it does the formatting for you after you've set it up. And then I've mentioned references as well. So numbering references within a document. Um, so whether you want to use bullets or lists, it works very beautifully with lists and bullets. Um, citation I've also mentioned, and there are different templates for that as well that can help you when you're building up your document. Um, and the nice thing about LaTeX as well is that it's customizable. So if you have a certain style of writing that you use, you can um, make a template for that. And every time you need to write, you just change the content uh, because you, you have a standard document that you've already set up. And it is quite user friendly, even though like any other program, when you start using it, it can be quite difficult or it may be you know, time consuming because you're learning basically how to use a new product um, or a new platform. But once you've learned it, it's user friendly, this documentation that you can use to um, to find whatever that you're looking for, like simple Google. And I'm gonna show you guys, um, I'm gonna show you later as well. And then you can easily convert your files as well. So you can convert them into PDF, for example, HTML files. And this allows you to share your, um, your work easier. Um, I want to share my experience with LaTeX. So I learned LaTeX when I was in university and I was forced by my lecturer, the entire class was forced by my lecturer because he refused to accept um, documents that were not pre uh, prepared in LaTeX um, for our research. So at the beginning, we all murmured and we didn't want to do it, but I'm so glad that I learned it. And what was nice about it is that in as much as he forced us to do it, I've mentioned that you can make templates. Um, he, our department has guidelines on how they want reports and journals and articles to be written. So what he did is he went and he set up 
the um, using the doc, uh, the departmental guidelines, he set up a template. So it made it so much easier because every time we needed to write something, we took the template and we just edit our content and it was ready to submit. And um, one of the things that I used it for, or we used it for was for our, um, our group project, one of the projects that I work for was a, worked on was a group project. It was so much easy to collaborate because we could, everyone could be on the document at the same time. So similar to a Google Doc, um, but we could work on different sections at the same time. It made editing easy as well um, and the formatting. So we could copy paste formatting throughout the document, which meant consistency. And um, it just made it so much easier with the flow of work because we could assign different sections to different people. And when they're done with that work, they could go proofread part of the document. So it was just, it just gave a nice flow to the work. And another thing that was nice was version control. Um, one of the projects we worked on had phases. So it was easy to just copy from the previous um, phase and work on it, remove and edit as we see fit. So it was nice to keep track of all, of all our versions. And the nice thing about it is that you download it once you're done. If you're not done, you can just keep it there. And then when you're done, you can just download everything instead of saving every time a new document like you would maybe on, on Word. And then things to keep in mind, like I said earlier, it might be hard to learn at first because especially if you're new to it, um, the other thing is that you don't see what you're typing. There is a, um, the, the way the interface is set up, you can recompile. And I explained that when I do the demo, that's when you will actually see how your document is going to look. So a lot of, a lot of people get a bit, and I mean, that was me as well when I started, because with Word, you used to seeing what you're typing as it would appear if you were to download the document. But with LaTeX, it's a little bit different. And the other thing is that there's so many options, there are so many packages, and it can be overwhelming when you're starting off. But um, I will also share, as I do the demo, some tricks and things to look out for that will help you if you are to um, start learning LaTeX. Um, okay, so LaTeX can, has offline programs. And you can work with LaTeX offline and online. So offline, that would mean that you'd have to download a program onto your PC, just like any other program. And okay, I don't want to spend time on this, but this text maker, um, there is Lix, there is Text Studio. So these are things that you would download the same way you would download Microsoft Office. And then that's where you would do your work. And then it also has an online platform, which is a web-based on um, platform. And for most of them, you can work offline as well. And then as soon as you're connected to the internet, you're able to sync your work. Um, and examples of that are uh, Pap Papiria, Authoria, and um, Overleaf, which is what I'll be talking about today. And with the online platforms, um, there is a fee if you are um, collaborating. So for example, Authoria, can, you can create up to three documents, um, 10 if you're a student or an educator. So some if you are in an institution, you can um, get Overleaf, all these other online platforms, for free because you are a student using your university email depending on when you um, depending on whether your institution uses overleaf or not um and then okay overleaf i'm going to talk to uh, talk about in a bit and then on this slide which so this slide is on the shared doc documents as well so this is more on overleaf and then the best latex editors and templates um i also have um, a link to the documentation um, for LaTeX as well. And then I'm going to stop sharing my screen as I switch over to a different screen to show you um, how Overleaf works. Okay, so I'm just going to type Overleaf over there, Overleaf over there. Um, and okay, this, has this is now me locked on, but I'm going to log out so that I can show you how it looks. Um, so this is the Overleaf home, and if you're new, you can log in or register. You can register using Google or using Orchid. I'm going to say register using Google, except I'm not registering because I'm already registered. So I'm just going to log on. Let's just go back to that. Um, and I'm going to log in using my Google. 
And which one did I use? Let's try work email. Nope, wrong account. Um, personal account. Okay. So this is how it looks. And so if this is you creating a document for the first time, you will select new project. And let's say blank. So you can select a blank project. You can select a example project or you can upload a project. So as I mentioned that um, my lecturer did create some templates for us. So we used upload project because we were using the template that he created. And the nice thing is that you have an academic journal, you have a book, you have a formal letter, homework assignment, poster, a presentation, a project, your resume or your CV, your thesis. Let's go to view all and see all the options or all the templates that you have. Okay, there's one that I've, I had already selected. So I'm gonna go back so that I'm not doing a lot of new things. But, um, let me use this one. Um, so what you will then see on Overlook, depending on the template that you select, you will see this here. So this is everything that's in the document over here. And then this is your document outline. And then this is your source. So this is basically where you'll be doing your writing and your formatting. And as I mentioned, there are so many templates online. You can um, just copy paste whatever you need. And I'll show you back um, that a bit later. And then once you're done making changes here, you click on recompile, which is, this is this part then shows you how your document will look. So, um, and then on your menu, you have, if you want to download it as your PDF, if you want to download the source code and you can link it to your Dropbox, you get to your GitHub and you have spell check. And I notice also that Grammarly um, also pops out when I start writing here. So I have Grammarly the plugin. So it also pops out when I'm writing on the document. Um, you also have a dictionary and then you have your fonts over there. But what I really wanted to show is that you can sync it, you can sync your overleaf to different platforms, including GitHub and Dropbox. So now, oops. I closed that by mistake. Okay, so let's say we want to see what's going on with this document. Right, so I have this entire, so let, let's say you choose one of the templates and you want to know what is going on with the template or what is what on the template. Um, if you go to the document preview and you click anywhere on the document, on your source, it will take you to the text. So as you can see on the documents, usually the template you, you will blah, blah, blah. That's what it has highlighted over there. So if I want to now change this, I can go and delete it and say this is an empower, empower session. Oh. And then if I recompile, that paragraph should change. This is an empower session. And because this is a lot to take in, I said I'm going to show you how to do some Googling with this. So I'm just going to type how to start a new, to create a new document on Overleaf. And if I do that, it takes me to the documentation and it literally explains to me how to do it. The nice thing about the documentation is that on the side as well, you have creating a document, uploading, copying a project, um, working offline with Overlive, using track changes. I spoke about version control, sharing your work with others. And then these are the basics. Um, so paragraphs and new lines, bold and underlining your lists, your errors. And if you work with equations um, and mathematical expressions, sub subscripts and um, superscripts, brackets and all that. And then you have your figures and tables as well, your positioning, your list and tables of figures. And then the thing that gives a lot of people headaches, your references and citations. You have a few um, 
templates to choose from. And then I've mentioned languages as well. So these are the different languages that you can use. And then this is your document structure. So if you want to have sections and chapter, chapters, your table of contents, your cross-referencing and all that, if you need to have a nomenclature as part of your document. And then this is now formatting. So um, your headers and footers, your page numbering, and so on and so on. So I want us to now um, create a new document a blank document and then start copy and pasting some of those things. So I'm going to say new file, um, empower doc. There. Mm, there it is, yeah. empower doc. So we want to start a new document. You're gonna go to our documentation and see what they said. So we already said a blank document and all that and all that. Um, so that's what we have. So creating a document in later. If you go to that, it should give us a simple outline. So this is what you do. Your document class, you want to say, is it a report? Is it a journal? Is it an article? And then what is important is the begin document and end document. So this is like starting your, your it's literally starting your document and ending your document. I'm just going to copy all this paste it onto my new document. And if I recompile it, I should be able to see the changes. So this is my text, first document, this is an example. So if I now want to change this text, I can just, if I delete it, I'll have, I should have a blank document. You see no PDF, because there's nothing on the document. Um, this is our, First, if I recompile it, that has changed now. And then I can go ahead using my documentation. Let's say I want um, headings, but I'm just going to do this. Mm, this. Okay, so now I can go and change the title. If I recompile, the title should change to empower and that It should also change to escalator. And it's just a copy pasting of the code. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want me to play around with so that you can see if this is too much information. <laughs> Anybody? That's, that's really lovely. And I think. Um, Given that people that there were people in the audience here who's um, concerned about using reference manager, this might be a whole other ball game. Um, but what we wanted to do with showing you Overleaf and Later is just to show you what is possible, and in the years to come. Um, you know, maybe you'll start using these tools, but it's just good to know about them. And for those of you who are ready to use it or to try it, of course, there's that opportunity. And for those of you who are lecturers, um, I think it's really important that um, as South Africans, we also are aware of what's happening in the international landscape in terms of publishing um, and that we are familiarizing ourselves with these tools and seeing how it can be used in our own context um and gradually just um updating our own practices as well i think um just this morning i was part of a conversation of people talking about um if i can call that conversation up again um in working <laughs> in the on uh, people working on an executable paper so we know that when we're publishing, the moment that we write that article up, well, often when we write an article up, 
the data that we writing up about is already collected months or in some cases even years ago. So now we're writing this article. The article processing time can be a year and sometimes more. So by the time our article hits the journals or is available online, the information that we wrote up is often quite outdated. Um, mm. And in the meantime, we may have already been doing further research because our careers are continuing or, you know, people in the lab is continuing to look at this or other information is becoming available. You would, would have liked to update your um, introduction or your literature review or um, even your hypothesis or, you know, some additional data became available. But that paper is now set in stone. Uh, you're not going to edit it. But people are working on um, an ex uh, articles as living documents and um, executable papers and that's I'll show you maybe in the practical session on um, in two weeks time how our markdown can offer that opportunity for you to include your writing and your data analysis and with a click of a button generate a pdf or an html or a word document that includes your analysis your writing and your plots or graphics um that you want so there's there's a lot happening beyond word and google docs and um some of the other tools that we mentioned here and it's not necessary for all of us to go and learn how to use all of that right now but it is good to know about what is out there and what might be expected of us as researchers in other positions at other institutions in collaboration, um, uh, networks with, with people from other parts of the world. Um, and yeah, if there's anything that you would like to know more about, or if you would like to learn to use any of these tools, we'd love to find opportunities to, um, you know, run collaboration sessions, co-learning sessions or workshops. So it would be really good if we can get some of these skills into our research communities. So thanks, thanks very much for that, Norma. And thank you very much, Neo, as well, for your presentation.